officer, a position he had held since July 2006. From January 2005 to 2006, he was chairman of the Board of National Bank Financial Group and of NatCan Investment Management. He also served as chief executive of National Bank Financial. Mr. Vachon began his career in 1986 at L'Evêque Bobien. From 1996 to 96, he worked for Bankers Trust, where he served, among, as other things, as president and CEO of its Canadian subsid, BT Bank Canada. Mr. Vachon rejoined the bank in 1996 as president and CEO of InnoCap Investment Management. A year later, he was appointed senior VP, Treasury and Financial Markets. He serves as chairman of the board of the University of Montreal, co-president of the major funding rent uh, fundraising campaign for the Quebec Hospital Foundation. He holds a master's degree in international finance from the Fletcher School, uh, a Tufts and Harvard University Cooperative Graduate Program, and a BA in economics from Bates College. He is also a chartered financial analyst. In 2002, he was named as one of Canada's top 40 under 40. And he's very happy that he doesn't have to wear a paper bag over his head because the Habs won last night. <laughs> And they better win tonight. <laughs> Louis Vachon. And that's also why I uh, accepted to take uh, questions from the floor. Uh, so feel free to ask questions about hockey if you want to. Uh, beware, the, the answer could be quite long and quite uh, emotional. Uh, the, uh, I have, I'll, I'll say one thing about hockey and then I'll move on to uh, to, uh, to the speech, but uh, I have one major concern about hockey uh, and the sport in Canada. As you know, it's been a long time since uh, the Stanley Cup has been uh, won by a team in Canada. And so for national reasons, we all want the cup back in Canada, but now we have another reason we want the cup back in Canada. Silver is trading at $48 an ounce. <laughs> and, uh, that's in my speech a little bit, but the Americans have a bit of debt, as you know. So we want to bring it back before they melt it for its silver content. <laughs> so, good day, everyone. I want to start by uh, thanking the Empire Club for providing me with this opportunity to be back here in Toronto. This is the city where my kids were born. Uh, my wife and I very much enjoyed our life uh, here while I was working here for seven years. Now, I'm also proud to say that National Bank has been a, a key engine of economic growth in the GTA and many Ontario communities for over 100 years. Still, today, we are growing all our activities in the province, be it in personal and commercial banking, wealth management, and financial markets. Last year, we again clearly set out our ambitions here by launching a new state-of-the-art trading floor, which sits, as you know, on the former floor of the TMX. But today, my goal is to talk about how we at National Bank view the Canadian financial services landscape. I believe now it is a great time to be working in Canada banking's industry. It is ranked as the world's soundest by many global organizations. And its strength is rooted in sound financial matrix. Since 2008, the ROE earned by Canadian banks has outpaced that of US, UK, and Eurozone banks. Not surprisingly, the Canadian banking shares have uh, performed well on an absolute and relative basis vis-a-vis -vis their global counterparts. The sector's strong performance is due to several factors. For one, Canadian banks and Canadians in general are traditionally sound risk managers. Canada's growing and diversified economy provides banks with a strong and relatively secure client base. Canada benefits from a responsible banking regulation regime. This is due in part to frank and constructive dialogue between regulators and the industry. So should we take this inviolable, this inviolable situation for granted? I would say no. Can we do better? Certainly yes. I believe there are four things that we can do as an industry. The first one is to stay grounded. Despite Canada's strong financial sector performance, we are not invulnerable to international economic shocks. Global imbalances stemming from large trade surpluses in emerging economies and many oil producing countries, which have built as massive excess liquidity there, continue to pose a threat to global stability. These massive excess liquidities are not new. They began to build up early in the past decade 
and were channeled to a large extent into developed world real estate and financial markets. The result? Well, we all know the story. It is massive wealth destruction through financial defaults and a plunge in residential property values in many countries. These massive savings are a plus when invested in productive capacity. However, instead of investing their trade surpluses earnings in productive capacity, many nations, just as, such as China, are using their excess liquidity to buy sovereign debt in the developed world, where these debt levels are growing at a frenetic pace. In fact, if we're not careful, the next major global financial crisis could well come from a major crisis in sovereign debt. If we learned anything during the 2008 financial crisis, it is how interconnected markets are and that Canada is far from immune to future occurrences. So what can we do to prepare ourselves? The first step should be to work hard to keep our public finances in order. Our invariable fiscal position proved to be a great national asset in the past years. Let's keep that as a priority. We also need to make sure that Canada's private sector finances remain strong. Yet while business sector financial ratios are better than they've ever been, households are another story. The Canadian household debt is now at 148% of disposable income, rising above the US ratio for the first time since the late 1990s. Furthermore, household debt level increasing at multiple times nominal GDP growth and over many years may become a major problem. There are many causes for this rising debt level. Low interest rates and expansionary monetary policy have incited Canadians to borrow more and have been almost too successful in stimulating demand for housing and durable goods. In this respect, maybe we should learn from other countries. The situation in the US and UK markets are well documented, so there's no need for me to go back into much detail. That being said, we need to be careful about not making the same mistakes. In that matter, we fully support the measures put forward by Ottawa to slow debt increases. Increased awareness by the central bank, the Canadian government, and others of Canada's increasing household debt is a good thing. Our financial system has long been grounded in sound financial fundamentals. We need to keep it that way. Another step that we as Canadians can take to make our financial system stronger is to think small. To some of you, this may seem counterintuitive. At a time when global financial sector players are getting bigger, why would Canada want to buck the trend and think small? There are several reasons. The recent debt crisis demonstrated clearly that having many strong, though smaller, financial institutions may be better for an economy than just having a few national champions. Large global financial sector players are now so interconnected that many are too big to fail. During the recent financial crisis, this aroused considerable public fury in many countries when the public was forced to bail many of them out. Encouraging entrepreneurship is a big plus for almost any country in any industry. Entrepreneurship is a source of innovation and a spawning ground for new leaders. It fosters more competition and forces bigger businesses to be better. That said, the Canadian financial system is quite static. For instance, did you know that the average age of financial firms listed on the S&P TSX Financials Index is almost 100 years? During this past decade, entrepreneurship and innovation were not distinctive factors in Canadian financial services. Over that period, newcomers in the mutual funds sector accounted for only 3% of assets under management. In the brokerage industry, small retail brokers' share of total industry revenue fell from 10% in the first part of the past decade to about 7 or 8% right now. Canada's trading sector's record is not much better. Canada is among the world's largest grain, oil seeds, metal products, and oil and gas producers. Yet, with the exception of Richardson's in the grain business, we have few world-class trading houses in these commodities. Canada also has too few high-frequency traders and absolute return managers. My point is not that we don't have entrepreneurial success stories in the Canadian financial industry. We do. My point is we need more of them. 
There are a number of possible reasons for this entrepreneurial gap. For one, regulatory and compliance costs here are a far higher burden for smaller firms on a relative basis. But also, there was a flight to perceived quality by many investors stemming from the financial crisis coupled with the recent financial scandals. So why should the National Bank, one of the so-called big six, care about the smaller companies in the financial sector? For one, I am strongly convinced that our financial system will be healthier if we had more small and mid-cap financial services players. Secondly, they are clients and potential clients of the bank. For instance, National Bank provides many of these smaller financial sector players which broker services through the National Bank Correspondent Network. We also distribute products such as those of Front Street Capital, First Assets, and others. Finally, having smaller financial sector players around provides us with avenues for growth through acquisitions or joint ventures. Of course, fostering financial entrepreneurship is not easy. One useful way to start could be by asking entrepreneurs what they need. Among the questions that could be asked are, should we adopt a more tiered risk-based regulatory regime recognizing that one size cannot fit all? Also, should we remove the structural bias against outsourcing in the financial industry stemming from the GST by exempting providers of specialized products and services? Another way to help smaller financial institutions would be to restore confidence in the global financial system because these companies are the most hurt by the current flight to quality towards larger institutions. In short, if we truly believe in entrepreneurship, we all need to take action. For instance, at National Bank, we provide new players with access to our front and back office platforms, again, through our correspondent network. We also invest in the capital of specialized ventures, such as Alpha Pro, and are allowing some of our former employees to use their track records at the bank when they start their new firms. This was the case, for instance, with Hamilton Capital. The third step we can take to make our financial system stronger is to think Canada first. It is by prioritizing Canada's and its financial sector's interests both domestically and in international policy forums such as the G8 and the G20. One example occurred in a recent round of discussions about how to achieve a less crisis-prone financial system. For many years, Canada has been very strict regarding the application of internationally agreed bank capital regulations. However, at a time when some governments might be seen as overreacting to the recent financial crisis, Canada is playing a different role. This was evident in Canada's opposition to proposals to implement a punitive tax on banks. Canadian officials should be congratulated for objecting to attempts to punish its financial industry for the mistakes of others. Another way that Canada can show support for the country's financial sector will be to fine-tune regulations to make it a safe harbor financial for financial enterprises that are unable to conduct certain trading, hedge fund, or other activities in their home countries. The idea is not to set up, is not to set up a regulatory heaven for foreign institutions, but merely to apply the same treatment to foreign financiers that Canadian companies get. The G20 reforms regarding over-the-counter derivatives trading provide another good opportunity to reinsert, reassert Canadian interests. The global movement to channel derivative trading through central counterparty clearinghouses provides enormous advantages. Under such a system, clearinghouses will become counterparties to all transactions. That means offsetting positions can be netted out, which reduces balance sheet impacts and lower capital requirements. Furthermore, because clearing houses continuously mark to market each position, they can identify participants that are potentially at risk and act accordingly in real time. If a participant defaults, the clearing house collective resource can be used to support the system. And if that were not enough, central banks could always step in. Though such a system may not have prevented the 2008 financial crisis, the devastation would have clearly been better contained. A Canadian central counterparty clearing solution for repos should be fully operational within the next 12 to 18 months at the Montreal-based Canadian Derivative Clearing Corporation, better known as CDCC. That said, 
Providing a Canadian-based central counterparty clearing solution for other derivatives, such as currency and interest rate swaps, would be more of a challenge. Canadian banks' derivative volumes are larger in U.S. dollars than they are in Canadian dollars. Furthermore, implementing a Canadian currency and interest rate trading swap solution would likely take two or three years, too long to meet the 2012 G20 deadline. That said, we do need a local solution for currency and interest rate swap trading that would be supervised in Canada, not in the U.S., not in the U.K., where regulatory systems have failed miserably. Needless to say, private club initiatives sponsored by the same global banks whose behavior recently brought the financial system to its knees should be strongly resisted. A Canadian solution would make room for a larger number of participants, especially from the buy side, such as pension funds. Collateral money could be ring-fenced and used only to cover Canadian trade uh, transactions. So what can be done to increase the likelihood of a Canadian currency and interest rate swap trading solution? There needs to be a strong commitment from Canadian financial institutions, buy side players, and the authorities that a Canadian solution is needed to maintain the integrity of our Canadian financial system. In practice, this means giving the project high priority and committed to incur short-term costs in exchange for long-term gains. One of these gains would be the setting up of a comprehensive integrated architecture for derivative trading. This architecture would be comprised of existing products in the CDCC, the new exchanges traded contracts, and central counterparty clearing for repos, foreign exchange, and interest rates. Each piece would reinforce the whole. Canadian banks have greatly benefited in the past few years from the country's well-deserved reputation in financial markets and on the international stage. Let's continue to protect our collective interest there. The final thing that we need to do to make our financial system stronger is to work together. The good news is this is a very achievable goal. Canadian industry groups, including financial services, have a long history of working together. For example, the Canadian payment system was originally put in place by the Canadian Bankers Association. More recently, there has been a continuous cooperative effort between the industry, Bank of Canada, and others to alleviate the consequences of the financial crisis. One highlight of this cooperation was the successful restructuring of the asset-backed commercial paper market. Today, there is something new in the landscape, cooperation between industry groups to promote Canadian financial centers. In Toronto and Montreal, stakeholders from industry and government are joining forces to put forward initiatives that would be beneficial to everyone. In a global market, promoting a regional or national marketplace is not and should not be a zero-sum game. The big bang's reinventation of London and the UK is a good example. As a result, Montreal and Toronto's initiative to get more global business should be seen as complementary. Both cities want to export their know-how and to entice foreign businesses to do business here. A strong industry, locally and nationally, would be beneficial to all. To summarize, Canadian financial institutions have shown great resilience in recent years. They have provided a pillar of support for the country's economy during tough times, as opposed to a drag on it as they have been in many other jurisdictions. But we must not take this for granted. They say that history does not repeat itself, but rather that it rhymes. If that is true, it means that although the challenges and opportunities that tomorrow brings may be similar to those we have already seen, they may also differ in many ways. That means we need to adjust to be ready to face them. Thank you very much for your time. Okay. Um, I got this question several times so far, so I'll ask it first. Uh, do you support the proposed merger of the TMX and the LSE? Uh, I think we've been quite public and vocal on this. Uh, um, and I'll, I'll be as subtle as I am usually. Uh, we <laughs> strongly oppose the transaction uh, between the LSE and the TMX uh, for financial, strategic, and microprudential reasons. 
Um, on the financial side, uh, you know, we have a, there's no premium being bought, uh, being involved in the transactions. Uh, the LSC is um, a counterpart that's financially weaker than the TMX. Um, so uh, we don't see the logic there. Strategically, again, uh, we are not in agreement that it would be a good strategic fit. And I, I think you could read also from my text that uh, from a macro prudential front, uh, I put a lot of uh, emphasis and value on the clearing corporation. And um, you may debate whether to what extent a clearing corporation as operated by CDCC, which as you know is owned by the TMX, you may have debated prior to the financial crisis whether a clearing corporation was a strategic asset, but now after the financial crisis and what we see now developing uh, in terms of uh, financial uh, new regulations to prevent a uh, new financial crisis, I think a, a clearing corporation is becoming more and more of a strategic asset from a macroprudential standpoint. So my view is that Canadian regulated is good, Canadian owned and regulated is better, certainly when it comes down to the clearing corporation. So for all these reasons, uh, we, know we, don't, we don't support the transaction. Okay, uh, the next one. Louis, keep up the great work at National Bank. Thank you. Question. Thanks, Mom. <laughs> 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 what can National Bank and others such as government do to support Canadian manufacturers and exporters to grow their sales and marketing share globally? I get that question a lot. Uh, you know, I, I meet a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of our clients. Uh, as you know, most of our manufacturing clients um, export significantly to the U.S. and other markets. Um, I think we're playing right now, there's two things we're, we're, we're doing. The first thing is to having straight talk with our clients. And I keep telling some of our clients, I'm not your psychologist, I'm not your, you know, I'm not your local MP, uh, I'm your banker. And I think we need to have a straight talk. And the first straight talk that we have with our clients is to tell them, listen, if your business model and your long-term competitive position is based on an undervalued Canadian dollar, you got a problem because when we look at the financial landscape globally and what's we look down the pipe you know I think we see an environment which is going to lead to a uh, to a high value on the Canadian dollar whether it's going to stay at a premium I don't know but I think you should assume that the Canadian dollar will be a par vis-a-vis -vis the US or at a premium so if your old Canadian all your competitive position was based on a cheap currency here in Canada you got to adjust and you got to adjust to fast. Which leads to the other discussion, a discussion we're having with many of our clients right now. And um, some of that is tied a bit to the demographics of the entrepreneurial class in Quebec and in Ontario. Uh, you know, you take the typical entrepreneur in Quebec, for instance, he's probably 55 years old, he started his company 25 years old, 25 years ago, and is, is or she is at a crossroad. Either you invest in your company to make it productive and competitive in an environment of globalization and an environment where the Canadian dollar is at a premium, or, my friend, you gotta sell because the status quo is not an option. We call that the invest or divest phenomenon. And for a while, in 08, 09, you know, during the recession, just after the recession, people were just stuck at a crossroad. What we've seen starting in 2010 is people starting to invest in their company or starting to divest and sell the company to new management or whoever. And that's why we've seen pretty good uh, growth in commercial lending. The good news is the balance sheets of the companies in Canada, as I mentioned in my text, are very good. They're in good shape. People made good money when the Canadian dollar was, uh, was low during the 1990s, early 2000s. So the balance sheets of companies are in good and good stead. So it means that they have unutilized debt capacity to invest in their company, or there's underutilized debt capacity for the new buyer to finance the acquisition of the company. So straight talk and financing. That's what we're in. If you had to choose one definitive feature of National Bank relative to its competitors, what would it be? Aside from the French thing? Uh, <laughs> Uh, proximity. 
That's why I think we, uh, that's where we pride ourselves. We exist, we're present, uh, we're visible, we're very much present in our, in our communities. Um, that's why myself and uh, the other members of the senior management of the bank spend a lot of time on the road meeting customers, uh, our customers, the customers of other banks. And um, I think that's why we want to be known as, uh, you know, the most present uh, super regional bank in Canada. Okay, last question. What government fiscal policy would you support to strengthen both public and personal finances? Specifically, would you support an increase in the GST rate? Uh, the great question to ask in the middle of election. Uh, <laughs> bankers are usually, uh, you know, very discreet to uh, talk about these things. And I'll get uh, almost invisible on this one. Uh, th 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 there's, I think generally, there's not a single point. I think I leave that to, uh, you know, I leave that to the, the, the uh, government officials and, and to the general population. I think the, the only point I want to raise again is we need to, we should not take for granted our very good fiscal position in Canada. Uh, it's been an, a major asset. I think we need that. I think it's not just a question of good economics. I think it's good social justice. Uh, and it's also good uh, demographic justice for the next generations coming down. And um, so I think that's, we need to keep the focus really on, on, on the balanced books. The rest is, is a discussion for, for the public as a whole to have. Um, and that's why we have, a, I think, a very efficient uh, political system. Thank you very much. Thank you all for your time. Thank you very much. I would now like to ask my new neighbor, Mark Andre Blanchard, Chief Executive of Mark McCarthy Tetro, to do the appreciation. Yes. Uh, thank you, um, Louis. Thank you for an extremely insightful and clear message. Uh, our firm has been a very proud partner of the National Bank for the last 30 years. At McCarthy Tetro, uh, we uh, regularly conduct uh, client surveys. So very recently, I conducted uh, the survey on behalf of the firm. We go and ask clients what they think of us. And uh, so in that context, I met with several executive, senior executives at the bank. And um, as uh, one can expect, obviously the conversation often goes uh, well beyond the initial scope of the, uh, of the survey. So what I want to say is, uh, Louis, your senior officers were both uh, spontaneous and unanimous uh, when speaking about you. They say you have vision, a focused strategic plan. They say you get things done. They say you have broken down the silos to deliver one bank to the clients. They praise your clear, concise, and efficient communication. And one of your VP, uh, and I did not promise confidentiality, so, uh, <laughs> uh, but one of your VP, and not your mother, uh, uh, sad, not to take anything away from our past leaders, uh, Louis is the best CEO we've had. No surprise, your message today is a pure reflection of the qualities your people see in you. So, st you, so as you said, stay grounded, think small or foster entrepreneurship, think Canada first and work together. Very simple yet powerful words of action for all of us proud partners of the National Bank. So Louis, on behalf of everyone here today, I want to thank you and to echo the person in the room, keep up the great work. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark, well said. Uh, Louis, as a token of our appreciation on behalf of the Empire Club and everybody here, I'd like to present you with a book that's called Who Said That? Memorable Notes, Quotes, and Anecdotes, selected from the Empire Club of Canada speeches, 1903 to 2003. Thank you very much. Um, on your tables, you'll find uh, cards uh, with the next few events that are coming up. Uh, Tuesday, May 12th, uh, sorry, May 10th, we have Kareem Rajwani, Chief Anti-Money Laundering officer for RBC Financial, uh, and that will be in the Royal York. On Thursday, May 12th, uh, Peter Gilgan, founder and CEO of Mattamy Homes, and that's also in the Royal York, and we're, uh, we'll have more to come. 
Finally, I would like to thank McCarthy, McCarthy Tetro for being our event sponsor, First Asset Capital Corporation for sponsoring our VIP reception today, and thank you to National Bank for Financial for sponsoring our student table. Um, I would like to thank the National Post as our print media sponsor. This meeting is being recorded. We were not live today. We were recorded on Rogers TV. It'll be played on Rogers and replayed on Rogers and CPAC over the next few weeks. Uh, we are very grateful to them for their ongoing support. Uh, we are now on Twitter and Facebook and obviously empireclub.org. Thank you so much for coming. Hope you enjoyed today. Have a great afternoon. This meeting is adjourned.